I'll give you today uh, one of the one of the essay questions for the final exam. <laughs> there will be two essay essay questions on the final exam, right? There will be two big essay questions, two big essay questions. So I'll give you one of them today. Probably, I'm thinking of maybe I'll give you four, then you choose two out of them. Out of four, you choose two. So I'll give you <clears throat> one today. The question is, uh, is EU type regional integration is EU type regional integration possible in East Asia? That's the question. Is EU type regional integration possible in East Asia? That's the question. So I, I, then I'll give you three more as we move on. Not today. Later. So we were at uh, monetary union. This uh, integration, you know, we covered some uh, history, how the EU integration evolved over time from the beginning ECSC, right, down to uh, Lisbon Treaty, the latest uh, Lisbon Treaty, the Treaty of Lisbon on uh, constitution, right, constitution. So uh, the integration in Europe, I think, uh, uh, involved uh, many different issues. Maybe ran the gamut, I'm a full gamut from uh, you know, monetary, I mean, beginning, I mean, technical, functional issues. Then uh, they, you know, came down to uh, more, I mean, easier one, right? Free trade agreement, free trade area. Then customs union, right? Then common market, right? Then economic uh, monetary union, right? Economic monetary union. Then you have a more difficult one, political union, like a, you know, military and defense security integrations, right? So integration uh, on all levels, right? All, you know, these different issues are on the table in EU. Uh, the, the, the current state of uh, EU integration today, where are they going? I think uh, all the issues are on the table, right? Then uh, I think it, it almost goes uh, in parallel, but probably the most uh, developed one, I think is uh, monetary union, monetary union. Uh, which was signed 1992, right? 1992, Maastricht Treaty, right? Maastricht Treaty. Then the currency came into full circulation, EU, I mean Euro. Euro came into full circulation 2002, right? So the treaty was signed in 1992. Then the Euro, new currency, was in full swing 2002. 
Uh, then later it, it was called Eurozone. Those countries that joined in this monetary union called Eurozone. 12 countries, 12 countries. Um, Britain is outside of it, right? The UK did not join the Eurozone, right? And we can't, we can't go get into all the details of how security integration or political military integration is going. We, we can't do that. But this textbook, this chapter goes uh, some details into, in some detail into how monetary union is progressing currently, right? Since 2002. And uh, they focus on monetary union probably because uh, after 2009 financial crisis, this, this Eurozone uh, also suffered some crisis, right? So the viability of the Eurozone uh, was called into question at that time, 2009. So that's why this textbook gives some, <clears throat> some pages, several pages to the description explanation of how monetary union is, is proceeding today, right? Although they don't discuss in detail political union or social union, right? Uh, but monetary union uh, after the global financial crisis suffered a lot, right? Uh, not sure whether the Eurozone will continue. The reason being, it's important uh, to understand why the Eurozone um, under pressure currently. The biggest reason is that, uh, like I said, the, the Euro as a single currency in the wider Euro, Eurozone today the idea is that align, right? The idea is to align 12 different member countries' currency, right? Into a single currency, right? As we learn from the finance, global finance chapter, uh, is it easy? No, it's, it's difficult. Because like I said, uh, currency uh, is a reflection of different economic conditions, right? So 12 different countries in Europe today have different economic conditions, meaning different financial policy, different monetary policy. Uh, put simply, 12 different European countries in the Eurozone are divided into two groups, okay? Th this textbook doesn't have it. The Eurozone <clears throat> is divided into two, two groups, okay? One group, one group, Northern European countries, Northern European countries, relatively wealthy, stable economic conditions. And they are uh, surplus countries, okay? Surplus countries, budget surplus countries, export-driven countries. Germany is at the center. Germany is at the center. Okay? On the other hand, the other group, which is Southern European countries, they are uh, deficit countries. Deficit countries. And their economic conditions, their monetary and fiscal financial policies uh, revolve around government spending, government spending, okay? And high inflation. Okay? And high debt, their debt of countries. So by nature, these two groups 
have very different conditions. Therefore, they, they must have different monetary, financial, fiscal policies. Okay? This is, this is the problem facing the Eurozone. Okay, how you align these two different economies into a single economic zone. Right? So that's why the Euro, the idea of the Euro, single currency, from the start has rested on a gamble, so to speak. So deficit-prone countries of Southern Europe right, and surplus countries in Northern Europe, you can't align them. That, that's, the, that's the biggest problem here. Because Germany, particularly Germany, particularly Germany, their economies, their style is low inflation, right? Low inflation, right? And government uh, restraints on government spending. That's, that's German policy. Right? So how do you align these two opposed policies? Right? So when, uh, so th 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 there were some high risks imposed on these Southern European countries from the very beginning. Okay? But then the global financial crisis uh, broke up then these risks on, imposed on these Southern European countries just popped up, okay? Then the situation, then the argument <coughs> went uh, like uh, Germany uh, had to bail out these economies, okay? Pumping uh, billions and billions of dollars into the European uh, you know, Eurozone system, which, which German people rejected, right? They were asking, uh, the argument is that, you know, these Southern European countries, they have to reform first, right? So that was the Eurozone crisis after, after 2008, 2009. So uh, the lesson we have to get from these Eurozone crisis is that how difficult, right, the European monetary integration is, right? Um, if not the single uh, currency such as the euro, I think in normal situations, these detonations in southern European countries, uh, in normal situations, they were going to devalue their currencies, devaluation. They, they had they must have tools such as devaluation to, to pay back their debts, right? But when you join the, the Eurozone, you are stripped of these tools. You can't, you can't adjust your exchange rates once you join the, the single currency zone, right? So that's the problem facing these Southern European countries. You can't exchange, you can't change the exchange rate or you can't uh, adjust exchange rates. So these tools, financial policy tools are delegated to Brussels, okay? The only thing they have uh, left as, as policy tool in Southern European countries, they can cut their budget, okay? They can cut their budget, but they can't change. They can't devalue their currency. That's the problem here. Now, I think this is the most important fact, the most important aspect of um, monetary union. And each integration scheme, like a security cooperation, or um, like a social policy integration, they all have pr 
problems like this. Okay, we can't cover all this here, but if you're interested, you can go ahead and read about these different, you know, articles and newspapers on uh, different integration, like uh, schemes in different areas. So, um, the 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 next section, expanding the European Union, you know, membership is membership continue to expand. Membership in the European Union continue to uh, expand. Uh, it began as a six core member, right? Inner, inner circle of six. Then expanded uh, to 15, right? 15. As of today, 27. As of today, 27. Uh, 10 members from former Eastern European countries. 10 new members of former Eastern European countries. These, these are uh, even worse economies. Okay? 10 new members in the Eastern European uh, countries, they are even worse. Okay? You, you're, you're talking here about Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia. Hungary, Slovenia, Estonia, Latvia, these countries. Okay? They are not in, in the Euro, Eurozone, but you need to align even these economies or even these political systems into the European Union. Right? There's a huge gap in terms of economic you know, standards, political systems, right? So, uh, the rest of it, there's a discussion on Turkey, right? As a new member, you might want to read about that, discussion on that. And, and read about uh, the Lisbon Treaty. What is new, what is important about the Lisbon Treaty? There are some important things under this treaty. Okay? So you might want to read about that. Such as the High Commissioner on Foreign Affairs and Security Policy. Okay? This is a, uh, like a common uh, foreign minister for the entire <coughs> European Union. So this was introduced under the Lisbon Treaty. Okay, then the, the rest of chapter on uh, information, just skip it, okay? The rest of you know, pages in this chapter on information, skip it. We don't discuss that. Now, we, let's talk about East Asia. <clears throat> East Asia, regional integration in East Asia. The, the article I gave you, let's talk about this article. It's a rather long article. Uh, the way it was written, uh, a little bit different from the textbook chapter. A little bit more analytical, a little bit more professional, right? A little more professional, yes. But it has a lot of information, important information, and, uh, and about this region, East Asia. Uh, it is about China, Korea, Japan, right? Uh, now, a lot of things here. As I pose the final exam question, the, the key question here is, you know, what's the difference between regional integration in East Asia and regional integration in the European Union? 
right? Clearly, regional integration in East Asia is, uh, in a nutshell, uh, here regional integration is very uh, unsuccessful, incomplete, and there are many obstacles. Right? There are many obstacles. And it's important to know what are the obstacles to uh, integration in East Asia. What are the obstacles? And what are the prospects? Okay, what are the prospects? And again, uh, integration in East Asia uh, proceeds along different issues. Right? Proceeds along different issues. Uh, integration and regional cooperation along trade issues. Right? It discussed this. this article discuss, discusses that, trade issues, or regional integration along um, uh, security issues. Okay, security issues. And regional integration along financial issues. In other words, currency. Right? Same thing. Now, in general, East Asia regional integration is, like I said, very slow, right? Although it is progressing a little bit, very slow, unsuccessful. Uh, still, international relations here in this region, East Asia, is, is not based on multilateral uh, relations, but on what? International relations in East Asia based more on, not on multilateral relations, but on bilateral relations. Still, this region, East Asia, is, is based on bilateral relations, bilateral formations, which is the, uh, this was how East Asia was formed after World War II, okay? After World War II, when the U.S. came in, when they organized international relations here, they organized uh, in a way that bilateral formations, okay, rule this region. And we are still in it. We are still in that legacy, bilateral legacy here. Bilateral legacy meaning we don't have multilateral uh, institutions such as NATO, like in Europe. Okay? We don't have multilateral institutions such as NATO. Instead, we have U.S.-Korea treaty, security treaty, or U.S.-Japan treaty, alliance, so to speak, U.S.-Japan alliance, okay, U.S.-Australian alliance. So this bilateral alliance ruled this region. This, this was how this region was, uh, was born after World War II, okay. Th what is this system called? The San Francisco system. The San Francisco system. It's, it's casually called, East Asian uh, international relations are called hub and spoke system. <coughs> hub and spoke system. So that the US is the hub, okay? And other East Asian countries are connected to this hub as a spoke. This is the East Asian system, hmm? bilaterally. Other countries are connected to the US as a spoke, bilateral basis. This is the uh, structural characteristics of East Asia from the beginning. And, and currently, I think uh, there are some moves, if, if you read this chapter, there are some moves to transform this bilateral alliance system 
uh, into multilateral system. There are some moves okay, on monetary issues, on trade issues, on security issues. But like I said, very slow. These moves are very slow and unsuccessful so far. And U.S.-Korean alliance is, we know that it's important, right? Still strong, right? Still strong. Although we have six-party talks, six-party talks, which is <coughs> multilateral, okay? Very, uh, uh, one of the very rare multilateral security organizations, six-party talk, was born, okay? But uh, U.S.-Korea bilateral alliance, right, much more important than six-party talks still. Essentially, there are some major um, qualitative uh, some changes are on the way, right, such as some multilateral organizations, uh, things like that, move, move away from bilateral uh, toward multilateral institutionalization. Some major qualitative changes are on the way and imminent, but again, still uh, this bilateral uh, base is still strongly felt, right? So th this author says that, Douglas Weber says that there are two uh, divided opinions on, on this on the prospect of or direction of uh, international <coughs> relations in East Asia, there are divided opinions, right? Some are very pessimistic, right? Like such as, I mean, realists, they are very pessimistic about the development of multilateralization in this region, okay? Whereas some are a little bit um, um, optimistic. So there are divided uh, opposing views on this. Um, let me ask you some questions. Given, given that some qualitative uh, new changes are on the way, then when and how did we begin to have these qualitatively different changes in this region, in East Asia? That is my question. What are, what are the driving forces behind these qualitative you know, new changes in East Asia? Yun Sul Chan. Yun Sul Chan? No? Uh, Yi Gyeonghwa. Yes, uh, there are some, some changes on the way in this region. You can feel there are some changes are, are uh, occurring. Then uh, when and how Eastern European countries such as Korea, China, Japan, or Singapore, Thailand, hmm? these countries, when did these countries begin to feel that we might need some new changes in this region. Maybe we might need some multilateral institutions such as NATO or EU type institutions. When did Eastern European countries begin to feel these kinds of um, uh, changes? What, 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 what was the, what were the motives behind these current Changes. I think as many of the nations started to like have different uh, agreements, they had to make more negotiations to carry out the uh, trade agreement and pick the partners or trade that would be part of the region. Well, that doesn't answer directly my question because you know my question is that yes, I mean, Eastern Europe, uh, East Asian countries, they. Uh, begin to uh, you know build some FTA uh, networks, right? Free trade networks uh, among themselves. 
But my question is, yes, these are one of uh, these new changes, okay? Free trade agreements, either bilateral or multilateral, right? These are new changes, but what brought these changes? What brought these changes? I mean, before, before uh, in the past, I mean, Eastern Europe, East Asian countries, right, I mean, they, they were not interested in FTA agreement, right? But there were some, some motives, right? There were some motives. What are these motives behind these either FTA agreements or six-party talks or uh, EAS? You read that, right? EAS, East Asian Summit, <coughs> or APT, APT meaning Asia, uh, ASEAN plus three. These are new institutions, ASEAN plus three, six-party talks, East Asian Summit. East Asian Summit, EAS, is the most, uh, the most uh, comprehensive, okay? Comprehensive, <coughs> most ambitious project, EAS, because it, it, it's similar to really the EU. EAS is really similar to EU, okay? ASEAN plus three is ASEAN already integrated, okay, somewhat. ASEAN, Southeast Asian region is integrated somewhat, okay, on trade and security issues. And they reached out to China, Korea, Japan. Three. This is ASEAN plus three, okay. So ASEAN reached out first, okay. It's kind of interesting. Okay, they are small countries, relatively poor, but then they took the initiative, not Japan, not China. ASEAN, in this region, ASEAN took the initiative. Why ASEAN, right? So ASEAN, they integrated first, then made proposals to China, Korea, Japan. Why don't you join us, right? That's ASEAN plus three, okay? So they, they meet every year. These 13 countries meet every year. They don't have headquarters yet, okay? So still, it's a discussion uh, forum. It's a club, okay, where these leaders from 13 different countries gather, discuss uh, issues of regional concerns, okay? but they don't have headquarter and staff, okay? Meet, go home, meet, go home, okay? That's the situation here. That's ASEAN plus three. ASEAN plus three developed further into East Asian Summit, okay? East Asian Summit, much more comprehensive. East Asian Summit, ASEAN plus three, there are more additional countries, okay, Australia. New Zealand, even India, okay, even these countries. It's really East Asian wide organization. So it's, it's becoming, it's coming much more looks like a EU, East Asian Summit, okay. Again, you know, still administratively it's nothing, okay. They just meet in some location once a year, that's it, okay. So East Asian Summit, all these, and FTA agreements, you have uh, like a crisscrossing of all these different FTA networks. Some are bilateral, many bilateral, and some are regional, right? Like ASEAN, ASEAN 10 countries, they have a region-wide FTA area, okay? 10 ASEAN countries, they, 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 they don't levy taxes, tariffs. So within that ASEAN, free trade area. So that's regional FTA, okay? Regional FTA. So FTAs, bilateral, regional, okay? These are new, right? These are new, really new. Then six-party talks, six-party talks, something new. Because uh, East Asian countries, I mean East Asian region, 
still suffer many security problems, military problems, threats. There are threats, right? Uh, in resolving these security threats, in the past, East Asian countries, they resort to uh, bilateral mechanisms, right? There is a North Korean threat. And the way we handled these issues was that, you know, minister from the U.S., minister from Korea, they meet, discuss, propose some policies, right? Then this U.S. minister uh, then visits Japan, okay, do the same thing. U.S. Jap Japanese, right, meeting, then U.S. Chinese meeting. This is the way <clears throat> this, you know, security problems were resolved in the past. But we, we came up with this new idea where why don't we six different countries in this region get together in the same place, discuss this common issue of North Korean threat uh, at the same time. That's six-party talks. First, multilateral security uh, talks in this region. So, again, which is new, right? Which is new. And we are asking whether six-party talks develop further into even broader, six, broader security, multilateral security institution in this region. Right? So these are new moves, new changes. So my question is, including FTAs, including North Korean threats, uh, what brought these changes? That is my question. What brought these changes? There are some, uh, right? There are some momentums where countries in this region, they felt some need to, right? Try something new. What are these? Right? Do, we have, do we have some multilateral currency cooperation? such as the euro here? How about currency cooperation, financial cooperation? We know how East Asian countries cooperate on the North Korean threat, right? In the context of six-party talks. But how about currency issues, right? You don't know? Can anyone answer this question? Union began as a very technical, functional <laughs> cooperation on, um, you know, coal and steel issues, right? The reason being that there were needs there, right? There were needs, right? After World War II, the devastation uh, from the World War, they need cooperation between two industrial powerhouses in Europe, Germany, France. Manufacturing production at that time, steel and coal, key. Okay, steel and coal is key at that time. So uh, to revive the economies in Europe at that time, it, it, it was crucial to bring these two big economies under one roof, okay, on steel and coal issues. Now, East Asia today, look at East Asia today. What is needed most in this region? Look at that. Right? Integration doesn't occur on artificial issues, right? <coughs> Integration occurs because countries needed them for practical purposes, right? So integration today, East Asian integration, very uncertain, slow moving, right? Unsuccessful, but um, it's coming along because countries need it. Countries need it. The reason being, I think he, he pointed to one very important uh, reason. East Asia still, we suffer a lot of problems. We have security problems. We have many security problems, okay? Including, as you said, if you look down to the Southeast Asian Sea, 
East Asia, geographically, right? East Asia is separated by many seas, open seas, so that we have many islands, right? In the southeastern <coughs> area, right? So there, a uh, high level of uh, conflicts over these maritime issues, territorial issues. So there are territorial disputes there, down in the Southeast Asian region, territorial disputes, okay? These are real security threats. And we have North Korea, right? North Korea, the reason, the nature of North Korean problem is very complex, right? It's not just the weapons. It's a problem of democracy. They, they, they have different standards about democracy. North Korea has different standards, different culture, right? Different culture about how uh, a country should be run. They have totally different culture, philosophy. That's the problem, right? So how do we, uh, as a region, how do we resolve this you know, different philosophy issue in North Korea? Economic gap issue, right? The huge economic gap. Unlike in Europe, East Asia, like I said, uh, economic gap is huge. Some countries are rich, others are very poor. So the gap is very wide in this region. And that becomes a security threat in North Korea. Right? And geographically, we have many different uh, islands so that we have territorial disputes. Um, another problem in this region is that uh, some countries are very powerful, such as China. In terms of size and resources, they are very powerful. And others, like ASEAN countries, okay, very weak. So power gap is huge. So ASEAN, particularly ASEAN countries, they feel threatened by China, particularly ASEAN. So how do we, uh, as a region, how do we uh, help them live together peacefully? That's a problem, right? Great powers like China, but then leave it, and, and they, they have to live with smaller <coughs> countries, right, in Southeast Asia. That's the reality here. And uh, on a different level, this article uh, emphasizes what uh, hampers, what delays or hampers integration in East Asia uh, more critically than others, than other uh, issues is the competition between China and Japan. These two big giants in this region, they compete, right, for leadership in this region. So unless otherwise we like a, like a mitigate conflict between China and Japan, integration in this region will be impossible. As long as they compete for leadership position, integration in this region, impossible. That is clearly stated in this article. Then another issue. Uh, we have uh, Sino-Japanese competition, leadership competition, hegemonic competition. Then you have China-ASEAN power gap issue, right? So naturally, the U.S. is introduced as a broker, right? <coughs> the U.S. is introduced as a broker. That has been the way for a long, long time. Right? So another issue for integration, 
how we uh, give what kind of uh, position, what kind of role do we have to give for the United States? Okay. Should we invite, should we continue to invite the U.S. as a member in, in East Asia? Or should we exclude the United States? But if we exclude the United States, we have these problems. Sino-Japanese hegemonic competition, China ASEAN, uh, you know, <coughs> unfriendliness. Uh, yes, I think these uh, practical uh, needs, right? These practical needs drove, moved toward new changes in this region. So to speak, the rise of China. This article, this article uh, point to two very important reasons behind new changes. Number one, the rise of China. Since China has become so strong, okay, since China has become so strong, the, the basic makeup of international relations in East Asia has shifted, right? Because of the rise of China. What did we learn from our textbook about this. How do we explain this kind of changes using terms from our textbook? Changes in the distribution of power. Changes in the distribution of power. Because China has become so strong, right? China has become so strong. What is this perspective? Realist perspective. This is realist perspective. Right? The rise of China changes in the distribution of power. These are the reasons. <coughs> Another, the final point. The final point, is there anyone who, who wants to say about, about this? The final reason, most important one. Regional integration in East Asia sped up after this. What is that? Number one, the rise of China, okay? Second, what? Foreign policy, hmm? foreign policy orientation in favor of regional integration. No. Ninety-seven financial crisis. Nineteen ninety-seven, Asian countries suffered financial crisis. That is the most important turning point. Right? Most important turning point. 97 Asian financial crisis. Most important turning point for integration in this region. Before 97, what did it say? Before 97, uh, yeah, look at 316, page 316, page 316, <coughs> article, I'm, I'm talking about the article. Look at page 317. under the new heading, political cooperation. First sentence, 
read first sentence. Before the Asian financial crisis, there was no East Asian regionalism as such. This was the answer I was trying to get. I wanted to have. Okay? Before the Asian financial crisis, there was no East Asian regionalism as such. Get it? So East Asian regionalism began after the global, uh, after the Asian financial crisis, 1997. Hmm? Then the, then China began to rise. Additional reason, right? Additional reason. We wanted to uh, tame the rise of China in some institutional setting. Right? We, we wanted to harness China, big China, to some institution. That's the motive, additional motive. Right? Before 97, some regionalism there. Before 97, right? What, what were some regional institutions before 97? What are the examples of uh, regional uh, institutions before 97? There were some. <coughs> Very uh, <coughs> rudimentary types of institutions here. Oh, you, most of you looks like you didn't seem to read. Hmm? It's important article you should read. APEC. Before 97, APEC played that role, APEC. Okay? But... Uh, APEC is led by the United States. APEC was led by the United States, along with Australia. Along with Australia. Okay? Probably the first multilateral economic institution in East Asia. The first multilateral economic institution. Not security, economic, mostly economic. The main goal of the APEC it was founded 1988, founded 1988 by the United States and Australia. And the goal was to promote trade in the Asia Pacific region. The goal was to promote trade, free trade in this region. Okay. So first economic multilateral institution. But uh, when financial crisis broke up, many Asian countries felt, realized that APEC is, uh, is dysfunctional. Okay? APEC is dysfunctional. So that the power of APEC, the power of APEC dramatically reduced in the 2000s. It still exists, but almost uh, non-existent. APEC. Uh, take a short break and come back. Let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about on each issue, the state of integration, regional integration, regionalism in East Asia, okay? Then, uh, in other words, uh, where trade regionalism is going and where currency cooperation is going, then where security cooperation is going. So once we, once we do this, each 
then we'll get to um, most important one. What are the obstacles to East Asian integration? There are several important uh, obstacles to East Asian uh, regionalism. Now, in terms of uh, trade, in terms of trade, um, trade bilateralism uh, is very uh, active. Bilateral FTA agreements are abundant in this region. So, for instance, 1997, 1997, free trade, bilateral free trade agreements were only seven at that time, 1997. But 2006, 42 signed. 2006, 42 already signed. Additional 35 under study or negotiation. So currently, I haven't counted, but currently almost 100 different <coughs> FTA agreements in this region, East Asia. Right? Although we don't have pan-Asian free trade area, we don't have it, but we have many bilateral, right? and some regional FTA agreements. Uh, most important regional FTA agreements are ASEAN free trade agreements. ASEAN 10 countries, they signed FTA agreements so that entire ASEAN region is free trade area. In addition to that, in addition to that, um, 2010, 2010, historic ASEAN China FTA was signed. ASEAN China. Through which huge free trade market was created in this region. ASEAN China FTA agreement, very important one. Uh, question. Southeast Asian region, right? In terms of free trade, very open, right? Very open and growing. And even China joined, right? But NEA, Northeast Asia, where China, Korea, Japan are located, What's the situation in NEA? SEA, Southeast Asia, right? Free trade, rampant, you know, widespread free trade uh, agreements. But NEA, do we have a free trade agreement in this region? No. There is no bilateral free trade agreement signed in Northeast Asia. Okay, no agreements between China, Japan. Okay, no agreements between China, Korea. No agreement between China, Jap uh, Korea, Japan. Nothing. Nothing. So what a contrast, NEA, SEA, right? That I want to emphasize. How about currency cooperation, monetary cooperation? We, we learned that EU is, is uh, suffering some monetary problems, currency cooperation problem. How about currency co cooperation in East Asia? Um, again, 97 Asian financial crisis 
Because of that, Asian countries felt strong need to cooperate on currency issues. Japan proposed a so-called Asian Monetary Union after the financial crisis. Japan proposed Asian Monetary Union. But China opposed Japan's proposal. Instead, CMI, CMI, Chiang Mai Initiative, Chiang Mai Initiative is the only uh, financial <coughs> currency mechanism <coughs> in this region. Chiang Mai Initiative. Under which Chiang Mai Initiative, how you know, member countries benefit from Chiang Mai Initiative? Chiang Mai Initiative is not European type of monetary or single <coughs> currency cooperation, but on the Chiang Mai Initiative, when a certain country uh, suffers uh, currency failures, okay, like a shortage of currency reserves, then on the Chiang Mai Initiative, you can borrow dollars from your neighbors. That's Chiang Mai Initiative. Very like a limited version of currency cooperation. Right? Very limited financial currency cooperation. Security cooperation. Security cooperation. Two big security issues in this region is one is North Korean nuclear issue. Second, um, Taiwan issue. These are two big security issues in this region. Taiwan. And six-party talks was created to, to help resolve North Korean uh, nuclear problem. So who are the six countries? China, Japan, Russia, US, and two Koreas. These are six, six countries. Six countries. If you look at these six countries, right, to resolve the North Korean issue problem, uh, you can guess the the alliance of these countries, right? Clearly, Russia, China might uh, be on the side of North Korea, right? Japan and the U.S. might be side or on the uh, on, on the side of South Korea. So that uh, so far, it's been almost twenty years, right, since its creation, almost twenty years. But the way it uh, proceeded is that always China, Russia blocked U.S. proposals, U.S. and South Korean proposals right, regarding the North Korean nuclear problem. Right? So that so far, no tangible outcomes yet. North Korea is still developing. Right? <coughs> Nobody knows how many exactly, how many bombs. We don't know. And there were sanctions, but then again, you know, they stopped for a while, then they restart the program again. That has been um, right, repeated again and again, still today, right? So six-party talks 
the first multilateral security uh, organization uh, is again called uh, the rationale uh, is being called into question because it's very uh, dysfunctional in terms of solving North Korean problem. Right? So six-party talk you know, is, is one thing that in reality, as this article argues that, uh, uh, you know, at the end of the day, finally, you know, bilateral mechanism really drives the negotiation, right? So that six-party talk is just only on paper. You know that you, you must remember that in the East Asian context, regional integration, ASEAN is playing central role. ASEAN is playing central. ASEAN is reaching out, right, making proposals. Then China, Korea, Japan respond, right. So a ASEAN is playing a central role. Now we'll get to page 325. Page 325. Obstacles. These are important things. Page 325. What are the obstacles to um, integration in East Asia? Let's take one by one. The first uh, major obstacle uh, is, as I mentioned before, um, page 3 to 6, second paragraph. As with France, Germany, as with France and Germany in Europe, close regional integration in East Asia presupposes close, cooperative, Sino-Japanese relationship. This is number one, uh, number one obstacle. Close Sino-Japanese relationship is crucial to integration in this region. And this article goes on to say, uh, two countries account for roughly 80% of the uh, entire wealth of this region, 80%. And in European cooperation, in, in European integration, Franco-German cooperation is crucial, was crucial. Right? Likewise, in East Asia, Sino-Japanese cooperation is crucial. Second, second obstacle. Second obstacle. Hmm. Okay. A little bit complex argument. Second, second, second obstacle. <laughs> A little bit complex argument. Um, I'm talking. Of, I'm, I'm. I'm looking at page three twenty seven. Three twenty seven. Why integration in this region is is so minimal and so slow? The reason is uh, the benefits of economic integration in this region 
uh, is not that big for member countries. That's the argument. It's not that big for member countries. In other words, the market gains to be made from regional trade liberalization may be so modest, so small still. So uh, countries and businesses in this region, they are indifferent to the outcomes of regional economic integration. The reason is, is well explained here. Hmm? Why the benefits of uh, regional uh, trade liberalization are not directly given to member countries and businesses. The reason is uh, relatively high proportion of East Asian intra-regional trade is in intermediate goods, intermediate goods. I think this is important in understanding the economies in this region. In other words, many economies in East Asia, they don't produce um, the, the entire final products in this region. Okay. In other words, most East Asian countries, they provide intermediate goods, parts, parts, <coughs> maybe to China. Then factories in China, they assemble these parts from different countries in East Asia, then export it to Western markets. This is the basic economic structure here. So even if trade is liberalized, doesn't matter much to East Asian countries themselves. Because already intra-regional trade is already, in terms of proportion, high enough in this region. So trade liberalization doesn't mean much to East Asian countries because they are just parts suppliers, not final products makers. So this is the second reason. Important in understanding the nature of economics here in this region. Number three reason. The final, final reason why integration is slow in this region is that differing political systems, differing political systems, In other words, th there are large disparities. There are large disparities uh, in terms of political systems. In terms of political systems. And economic development. This is the biggest obstacle to regionalism here. Like for instance, even within ASEAN, within ASEAN, some countries are uh, <coughs> much more authoritarian than others. Okay? Much more closed. Okay? Much more closed than others. And some are still, you know, old communist systems. Not to mention North Korea, right? Uh, I think this is the basic dilemma facing East Asia. Huge disparities, uh, in economic and political systems. And also geographically, right? It's widespread, 
but divided by uh, many different seats. Right? Th these are real, real obstacles to uh, regional integration, unlike the European, <coughs> European region. Okay, these are three big obstacles to integration. But then the rest of pages, I strongly recommend you to read pages after 328. Very interesting uh, pages here. Page 328, 329, 329. Read it. Very interesting region. Very interesting section here. Uh, let, let me let me read several lines here on the regional peace and stability. Question here. Then, uh, you know, integration, we, we learned that integration is uh, unsuccessful, uh, you know, slow. But then the question, at the end, he asked, uh, Douglas Weber asked this question, then what are implications? What are implications of this unsuccessful integration for peace and stability in this region? Peace and stability in this region. Right? In other words, can East Asia go peacefully, as peacefully as before, with this level of integration? Right? And it begins, he, he says that since 1979, there is a long peace in this region. There is a long peace. 79, there was an invasion of uh, Vietnam. Okay? But since then, there are no wars in this region. So there is a long peace. Okay? But there is a long peace. But but current changes suggest, like I said, there's a very significant shifting uh, regional distribution of power. Okay? There is a shifting regional distribution of power. Okay? Which suggests, I mean, raise a lot of questions about peace and stability. Peace and stability. And, and there are flashpoints. Right? There are flashpoints. Two flashpoints, important flashpoints. One in the Korean Peninsula. Second, Taiwan Strait. Th these are flashpoints. These are candidates for potential regional conflicts. And it goes on to say that, you see, again, observers are divided. Observers are divided as to, uh, as, as to whether or not peace and stability will be maintained or not. Opinions are divided. Realists? What, what realists think? What do realists think? Realists think war is possible in East Asia. War, war is thinkable. Either on Korean Peninsula or Taiwan Strait. War is possible. Or somewhere in Southeast Asia, territorial disputes. War is possible. That's re what realists think. Right? War is possible. How about liberals? There are two kinds of liberals, according to him. Commercial liberals, which is interesting. Commercial liberals. According to commercial liberals, uh, there are many trades going on. FTA agreements are signed. So commercially, East Asian countries are interdependent. So war is unthinkable because of these commercial connections. 
These are commercial liberals. How about Republican liberals? Republican liberals, war is unthinkable for them, but not because of commercial connections and interdependence, but because that democracy has spread. That's Republican liberals in this, in this region. Democracy has spread. To manage the rise of China is critical. To manage the rise of China is critical. Because the rise of China is changing the balance of power, according to realists. According to realists, war is thinkable because of the rise of China. War is thinkable because of the uh, rise of China and the shift in balance of power. So, ideally, ideally, to get around all these problems, okay, we need to build institutions. We need to build institutions. We need to deepen integration, like in the European Union. But integration is slow, right? So, hence the question, right? Peace and stability. Prospects for peace and stability. Right? Without integration. That's the dilemma facing East Asia. Prospects for peace and stability without integration. Right? And page 330, he suggests important, interesting uh, points. What, what East Asian countries can do is to develop some soft cooperation within the region. Soft cooperation. Like a soft fall issues. As you learn from the European Union, right? Integration should begin with soft fall issues. Right? Easy ones, right? East Asia, the rise of China, North Korea, these are big issues, dif difficult issues. Why don't his recommendation is why don't you East Asian countries, why don't you focus on soft issues? Okay? Soft cooperation, such as migration. There's a whole bunch of issues East Asian countries can uh, cooperate on, like migration issues, resource scarcity, terrorism, climate change. These issues, these are softball issues. Right? There is much room for cooperation among East Asian countries. So his recommendation is that why don't you East Asian countries right, focus on these issues rather than North Korea and others, difficult issues. <coughs> 